when it all began, I was at the 20th Century Fox studio, and we were looking at Gumbasia, the, the clay music video with jazz, and Sam Engel, who was president of Motion Picture Producers Association, said, uh, that's the most exciting film I've ever seen in my life. And he said, can you make little figures out of that clay? And uh, I'll, I'll, I want to improve the quality of television for children. He had young children. And he was president of the Motion Picture Producers Association at the time. And he said, I'll finance a pilot film if you'll make some children's films with it using clay animation. So that's how it got started, is you, you did your kind of thesis in school. Uh, you had to do a film. Well, but, but I wasn't intending ever to get into clay animation. I was studying to do live action stuff. But what, what made you do that? What made you use clay? Well, uh, the, it was more economical and easier to do this study film without y using people. Gumbasia is a groundbreaking film because it was the first art film done to clay animation. Um, it was done to the beat of jazz music and it almost feels like an MTV music video. It's a four minute or five minute MTV video, but it's, it's, it's clay animation done incredibly with, with motion and movement uh, that is still used in film classes today. See, and a motive for making these clay films of Gumby was not for money. That's the beautiful thing about it. It was to give something to children of, of quality and something that they would really enjoy. Yeah, he, he and my mother were, were uh, they met at Hartford Seminary School. He was studying to be an Episcopal priest and she was studying religious education. And my parents felt very deeply about doing something good for children. And so when Sam Engel said that, I'm sure the pillow talk of my parents was, wouldn't this be great? Something good for children. And I remember my parents telling me, my mother anyway, that she, she and my father felt that the cartoons in that time, the mid-50s, were very violent. And they would love to do something that was better for children. So they followed up that good for children thing with their own values and brought that to Gumby. And then my dad came up with all the characters and they, they, uh, um, they and there was a pilot film that dad did. We made two pilots for NBC after they saw the original pilot and gave us a contract. They wanted me to start off by making two new pilots. And uh, the, uh, let's see. Gumby goes uh, to the moon. Uh, yeah, Gumby, moon trip and uh, something else. But anyway, they took these two pilots to New York. We did them and shot them in uh, Hollywood and they took, the, NBC took them to New York. The president of uh, NBC liked them, Pat Weaver, and they gave them to the producer of the Howdy Doody show and they wanted to audience test the Gumby on Howdy Doody. And they had such a good uh, reaction from the audiences that they gave us a seven year contract. Uh, they just, the only purpose of doing it on, on Howdy Doody was to uh, uh, see how audiences react to it. So uh, they, the sh they showed the first few episodes on the Howdy Doody just to see how it would. And then Gumby uh, got his own show. And then they gave him the Gumby show. And then, and then also they put Pinky Lee, remember Pinky Lee, on the show to introduce it. But it was still called the Gumby show. And Pinky came over to me one day at the studio and he said, could you persuade him to put my name in the title? <laughs> he didn't like playing second fiddle to a piece of clay because he'd been used to being at the head of his own show. But that was the first batch of episodes where he created uh, 22 12 minute um, Gumby episodes that in 1956 in the studio he had in Hollywood, in the upstairs of a warehouse. 
and then uh, they they eventually cut those episodes in half and made them uh, 44 episodes. And then uh, the episodes that were made after that in the early 60s, uh, my parents opened up a studio in Glendora called, and, and they, they started a corporation called Cloakey Productions. And that was the Cloakey Studios and Cloakey Productions and they did Davy and Goliath and they did New Gumby episodes and uh, things really started moving. My dad's kind of oh, like a, life. he's kind of like a Horatio Alger. He, he grew up in, sh in, in kind of the lower income neighborhoods of Detroit. And then when his dad died in a car accident at age 11, my dad, uh, through a bunch of other circumstances, ended up being an orphan. And he got adopted by Joseph Cloakey, who was this artist, creator. He was a musician. He was dean of fine arts at the university. And this was the middle of the Depression. So my dad went from the depths of, of, of sadness, of losing a family, to getting adopted by a man who had this creativity. He was a, he was a movie maker, a photographer, a naturalist, and a musician, and an artist. And I think my dad already was a good artist as a child, but I think he must have blossomed under, under my grandfather. Yeah. Every summer, I would go from Detroit up 80 miles north of Detroit to my grandfather's farm and uh, the family would go up there and we, we would uh, stay home on rainy days, but sometimes my father had to go out and he'd come back saying he got stuck in the gumbo, which was a clay soil because many of the roads were not paved. And uh, I learned that uh, that was a name that oil drillers use when they strike the gumbo, that is the clay layer of clay over the oil dome. The clay keeps the oil down there from getting up into the soil and uh, they call that the gumbo. That's why Gumby's clay. Gumby's a clay boy, so dad probably thought, well, gumbo was it stuck in the gum, that's the clay. So it's like the basis for clay. Unlike computer animation, or unlike cell animation, with stop motion animation, or clay animation, whatever you want to call it, it's real things. You're looking at physical objects, real sets, real miniatures, real pieces of clay coming to life because of that great technique of taking a picture, moving everything a little bit, taking a picture, moving everything a little bit, and then when you put it all together, it flows. And you, how can computer animation ever compare to that? Because it's actually, computer animation is trying to copy the real thing. Stop motion animation is the real thing. And the animators keep getting better and better at it. What I'm amazed at is that nobody taught him how to do it. And when you look at Gumbasia, it's amazing. I don't know how he thought of it. His main focus has always been I want something good for children. I want to have that rapport with the children. And my mother had the same way. My mother, Ruth, she, she did that with Davy and Goliath. She wanted that Davy and Goliath to be. And, and, and Gumby was um, something that was good for children. There was no Sesame Street. There was no PBS cartoons back then. There was just, there was just cartoons of the 50s and 60s, and there was Gumby. Yeah, Gum 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 Gumby was a lot different than those other ones. It, Gumby wasn't cynical. Gumby was more uh, wholesome, uh, more like what PBS does now. There were three major phases of Gumby episodes as far as look goes. There was the first 42, 44 episodes, which really were 22 episodes made into 44 episodes. There His was, eyes were red beads. Yes, yeah, the first group, Gumby was more organic looking. I think that was when Gumby was made with rolling pins and cut out and made very, you know, it was a lot of work to do it that way. And that, that Gumby had red eyes, red beady eyes, and the, the mouth, instead of paper cutouts, was actually clay that they animated talking. Those are my favorite episodes, because my dad had a, has, was really involved in those, and they, they came out of his subconscious, and I believe that those episodes are the most adventuresome, they're the, they're the funnest episodes for kids, for the kid and all of us. Then the second series of episodes is when Gumby started to be poured in a mold and he looked more refined. And that was in the early 60s. And uh, those are incredible episodes. The stories got better and more clever and they, there was more dialogue. Uh, there was still a lot of action. 
But they started doing uh, more sophisticated stories where they had history involved. Gumby helped George Washington cross the Delaware. Gumby, uh, there was a lot of, lot of different themes. Help, help the them. pilgrims. And there was some great humor, some great humor in the, in the second batch of episodes. The first batch was just pure wonderment, just childlike wonderment and adventure. The second batch was more sophisticated episodes, a lot of humor, uh, and that was because my dad grew up on Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton and had that kind of physical comedy. And that physical comedy shows up in the first batch, but then the, the storyline comedy starts coming out in the second batch. And then the third batch of episodes was in the late 80s. That was a completely different time. And they actually refined Gumby to look like he does today, which is, we all think, better looking. They, they made him really uh, the best of both. The reason we, and, uh, we shifted from Gumby having the red beads to having black discs was because uh, on television, the red beads kind of faded in. It kind of the red, uh, especially in, when on, that was in black and white television, the red bead would kind of fade into the background. So uh, we put the black disc on the white and that snapped it right up. So it was really sharp and snappy. I used to say that giving a child a toy was an act of love for the child, really down deep. And Gumby was uh, really an act of love to children. And I think children pick up on that. It, we weren't out to exploit them or make money. That's why I didn't want to have it commercialized or merchandised uh, for the first seven years. Because uh, I didn't want the parents to think we're out to exploit the children. We're out to give them something, not get something from them. And that was the main point. And I think the kids picked up on that. That it was, uh, it was a gift to them of love. In fact, uh, if you have a heart, then Gumby's a part of you. And yeah, the theme so, song is classic, you know. If you've got a heart, then Gumby's a part of you. And everybody remembers that song. Mm -hmm. If they, yeah, they, if they grew sing up it. on Gumby. They can, I mean, it hasn't after, been on the air in 20, 20 years. It's been 20 years since that song's been on the air and because it wasn't used in the new series. And, and uh, that song... These 30-year-old... 40-year-old, 50-year-old people sing the song for us. Yeah, and that, you know, you should see what Gumby can do today. Gumby! And da-da-da-da. Everybody can do the whole words, but it's... It's, uh, it was written by Pete Kleinow, who was an animator my dad hired in the 60s. And Pete is a, a session musician who's been on over 800 albums with his pedal steel guitar. He's quite a musician. Everything from John Lennon's Imagine album to others. And uh, um, it, it was quite a song. <laughs> what I've noticed through the years is that my dad respects the good animators. He respects the animators that have their heart in the right place. And he lets them work with the episode. Uh, when my dad watches some of the episodes, he'll, he'll say, I like what the animators are doing here. It's he, an art form. It's an art form. He, he realizes that. An artist, uh, if you're going to be an animator, you've got to admit that you're in the a field of art. It's an art form. He lets the animators do their thing. He, he respects the animators. Uh, my dad gives them the general outline or even the whole script. But then he lets the animators put a lot of their, their artistry into the, into the expressions of the characters. But he does keep the animators from using their cynical side. Because sometimes you get some, some artists that want to put their edgy 20-year-old energy into the animation. And he kept, that, kept them from doing that for the most part. Because if you look at some cartoons of today or some cartoons of the 60s and 50s, it's really more appealing to a 20-year-old than it is to a four-year-old because the people producing it were putting too much of their own wants into it. And my dad always kept in mind the children. And so he kept it so that a, a, a two, three, four, five-year-old can, can thoroughly enjoy it and not, yeah. and not get disturbed by it. But the beauty of that, in my opinion, is 
that we all have that childlike quality in us. So even when we're older, we enjoy the Gumby episodes because they weren't necessarily boring because he kept a lot of action going. He kept, you don't have to have cynicism and violence to be fun. I give, I give credit to my film teacher, professor at USC. Uh, I give him credit for all my success in making films more interesting because he taught me kinesthetic film principles which I incorporated in the Gumby films wherever the opportunity arose. And that is uh, making films more interesting and more exciting uh, subliminally by knowing how to cut or, or animate or edit uh, the film. So what's great about watching the, the 50s episodes is that Dad was using those techniques of kinesthetic film principles that he learned from Slavko Vorkopich at USC. And that you look at some of the editing in it and, 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 and some, of the, some of the shot selection and the way he had it, um, that montage sequence, it, very exciting to the eye. Well, kinesthetic film principles means feeling movement. Kinesthetic, the Greek, and the screen, the light on the screen impinges upon the eye cells and is carried to the autonomic nervous system. And you can, if you can know how to control the movement and editing and cutting, you can make it more exciting than it would be normally uh, because you can make it nauseous if it goes to extreme. But just under nausea, is the most exciting. He was precursor to MTV. MTV might go overboard uh, with the rapid fire cutting, but he was he was doing that. Slavko Vorkovic was uh, an immigrant from Yugoslavia, and he became head of the cinema department. He also was a director for RKO and MGM before he became uh, head of the cinema department. The, the most passionate fans of Gumby. And I could be wrong. I mean, a lot of people are passionate about Gumby, but I found, uh, Whoopi, Ed, Whoopi look at Whoopi Goldberg, Goldberg and Eddie Murphy. They're very passionate. They love Gumby. And, I, and I've talked to a couple of friends of mine, and they said, well, yeah, he was the only black character we had to look up to. You know, <laughs> everybody else was white in the 50s, and Gumby was black. I mean, Gumby was green, but it came off as black on the TV. What's great about Gumby and his pals is they're, they're not black or white. They're green, blue, yellow, and and uh, red or orange. Um, my parents were really into, in the 50s and 60s, were really into trying to make a difference. And they did one episode with Davy and Goliath that was called Polka Dot Tie, where they had this African-American boy who was Davy's buddy. And the other kids in the neighborhood were, were being prejudiced. They were, they were ostracizing Davy for hanging out with his, 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 his African-American boy you know, friend. And um, the network wouldn't air it. So that... Really? They, 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 they said that. they weren't going to air it if you called it what you were going to call it, if you addressed it directly as racism. So what my parents did to get around the network censors was... Um, I think the Lutheran Church and my parents combined thought of this together. But my mom tells the story that she came up with the idea, well, the black boy has a polka dot tie. Why don't we call the... Why don't we say that they're ostracizing him because of the polka dot tie? But everybody could see that it was really because he was, he was black. And so my parents um, were addressing racism at a, at a time when it wasn't addressed on TV and uh, trying to get away with it. <laughs> so they, they're, they're, you know, I was lucky to grow up around that. You know, that's why I think I'm, I think that's why I'm, I feel strongly about keeping the legacy of Gumby and Davy alive, their, their legacy is not um, cynicism. Their legacy is, is, is positive action, oh. adventure, um, love, that whole thing. The whole thing is, is if, if your heart's in the right place with what you're doing, whether you're a young animator or a young director or a young whatever you are, that you have to flow with what's in your heart. If you do what you love and you, and you put your whole heart into it and it's something for goodness, uh, the path that you go on will be a good path. 
And that's what my dad kept flowing with. And, and my parents, my mom was a very moral person. She has Alzheimer's now and she can't be interviewed, but she's still very vibrant and very excited that Gumby's coming back and very excited that Davy and Goliath is coming back. And she was very, um, you know, she and my dad had a studio outside of Hollywood that did two very significant children's television programs that um, have made a difference. And I think that's the, that's the thing that, that I'm most proud of for them. And I, I, you know, I want to see that continue.